Cryonics is the practice or technique of deep freezing bodies of people who have died in the hope that scientific advances may allow them to be revived in the future, like you would see in sci-fi movies. Believers of this concept believe that patients are not dead, they are in long-term care, even though there is no legitimate science to back it up. Facilities admit that it may not work, but they see it as an alternative life-saving technology. They are aiming for immortality. And yet, the problematic ethical and moral behaviour that this concept is based on regarding the financial, legal, environmental and social realms of society, both in present day and in the future, is just astounding. But for someone who wants to deny death's existence, this is where it can take you. Please subscribe, share and like. It really helps our videos get distributed more around the YouTube algorithm. Now let's talk cryonics. Cryonic preservation storage facilities currently operate in the USA, Russia, China, Switzerland and Australia. An interesting combination of countries. Now, I directly contacted all of these companies during my researching of this video and it was an interesting experience. One particular company in the USA told me that anyone not choosing cryonic preservation and who wants to go through the natural life cycle is obviously suicidal. A few days later, I mentioned this to a member of an Australian company who bursts out laughing hysterics at such a stupid thought. So we can assume that beliefs in cryonics vary just as widely as those in religion. There is a hell of a lot of info out there about how this process works or doesn't work. But say you want to defy death, what issues can we presume will come out from cryonics? Future science. Cryonics has no legitimate science to back it up. And most scientists believe that we are at least 1000 years away from being at the point where we're successfully able to reanimate these people. And that's assuming that future science does not disprove the way that they're currently being preserved to be viable. The companies who run these facilities say that it gives time for future medical science to come up with ways to cure the various diseases that the preserved have, which yeah, it probably will happen eventually. But these companies are not working on the science needed to reanimate these people. That's not part of their business model and they hide that very well. They do not have research facilities attached to them, physically or educationally. They are simply storage facilities. And in many countries, legally listed as cemeteries. So what is their plan for when a cure for the preserved person's illness is found? How are they prepared for that? Accountability during storage. Let's be conservative in our figures here and say that it's going to take 100 years until you can come out of storage. That's roughly four generations of your family that will have moved by. Now tell me, how often do you visit the cemetery to visit the relatives that you knew in life? Your parents and grandparents say. How many of you visit your great 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 aunts and uncles at a cemetery? Do you even know where they're buried? Do you know their names? Do you even really care if you know? So if the facilities that you are stored in goes bust, gets bombed, the manager turns into a mad scientist and attempts to turn you into a zombie slave, who's going to notice? CEO Max Moore of US company Alcor said in an interview, there are no guarantees. We don't know officially this will work. We don't know for sure that the organization will survive. Indeed, when asked what will be keeping cryonic staff accountable, Ben Best, CEO of USA's Cryonics Institute stated, just as a person may go into a hospital and be operated upon today by an unknown surgeon, cryonics professionals in the future will be motivated by contractual obligation. Now, I've been through a few surgeries in my time and I can tell you two things. One, the surgeon wasn't unknown to me. I had met them before and had many accounts from previous patients. And it was going to be the same surgeon putting me to sleep as waking me up, not his great 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 grandchild. And two, if they killed me in surgery and tossed me in the bin, I had immediate family members and insurance agencies that would make sure they were held accountable. Not your great 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 grandchild that will probably not even know that you're in a tube somewhere. So not exactly the best metaphor there. Give it two generations and they could simply switch off the electricity and throw you in the bin. <gasps> what? 
You're saying that big companies have never done anything so unethical? It's a very convenient gap. Sell the promise without the burden of proving the end result. Also, in most places, families aren't permitted to visit their suspended family members. Those who can are only able to see the steel tube that they're told their loved one is in. Speaking of family, during my contact with these companies and from reading all their information, there is a very big push to have their whole family preserved. Companies sell this as being for your well-being in the future because who would want to go on without their family? Now, I'm sure there are many people out there who would be perfectly happy to go on without their family, but for the moment, let's stick with this idea. When asked if it was better to leave money to your children now rather than use it for a potentially unsuccessful cryonics, Ben Best effectively said that if your family really loves you, then they will want to see you in the future and not achieve material wealth. Which really makes you wonder what kind of relationship he has with his children. But moving on, say you do want all your family with you. What does your family think of this? Now, a company is a business, so the more the merrier for them. And it's a very easy sell pulling on the old emotional strings. When talking to these companies, many were all about how lonely I would be without my husband and children. You can certainly see how a domineering and slightly unhinged family member could manipulate this into happening. Which brings us neatly on to my next point. Corpses do not have rights. While these companies continue to refer to the cryopreserved person as a patient, they are a corpse. Legally and practically, they are a corpse. And guess what? In the majority of places, corpses do not have legal rights. There are rarely any laws on the books about protecting corpses, and those that are there are more in response to moral outrage than the rights to the body itself. And when it comes to cryonics, this creates two big problems. Firstly, in that contract you signed, you signed over all rights to your body to the company. And since nowhere in there do they take full responsibility for successfully reanimating you, they can legally do whatever they like with your corpse. And secondly, even if you have no interest in cryonics, unless you specifically write that in your will that you don't want it, your partner can sign you up for it either immediately after you die or while you're still alive, but not in sound mind. There are also just as many pets as people currently suspended. So yeah, your new life. Now let's say the facility survives and in 400 years time, science has not only come up with a way to cure your illness, but also reanimate you successfully. Now what? Well, everything that you read seems to have a grass is always greener on the other side kind of vibe. And allow me to list a few things that I read during my research. And get this, wars will be over. Pollution no longer exists. Climate change is no longer an issue. Discrimination is no more. There is no more class divide. Robots are now doing all the jobs for humans and humans can now focus on recreational activities that they love. Yeah, I don't know what all these fellows have been smoking all these years, but they must have done enough to bring down a herd of elephants because that's some serious daydreaming. So let's assume that you were successfully reanimated into a more realistic world. Expectations of future people. You have just spent 400 years using up resources and causing pollution, and now you expect future generations to devote their time, energy, and resources to bring you back to the world of the living. The never-ending arrogance of humanity is astounding. Realistically, why should they give a shit? Sure, there will always be some, shall we say, nerds who may be interested, but most people just want to go about their daily life, pay the bills, feed their family. They won't want to be spending all their money or tax money bringing some old dude back to life from a bizarre science experiment. And really, does anyone honestly think our world resources are going to be in any better state than they currently are? Discrimination. Remember how we said earlier that these companies are pushing the grass is greener idea? And remember how they said there will be no more discrimination? Does anyone really believe in that? 400 years ago, humans were discriminating against others. 400 years before that, and 400 years before that. So why do we think that humans will suddenly have changed 400 years in the future? History has taught us that, yes, we should do better, but it's also taught us that we aren't particularly good with the follow through. Are future generations going to see these reanimated people in a positive light? 
or are they more likely to see them as zombie-like curiosities? And we all know how humans have dealt with zombies over the years. I would hedge my bets that the only way these people will be accepted back into society will be as some sort of motivational speaker talking about the good old days or in a freak show like as we've seen in the past. And that's on the slim chance that it goes well. Humans are partial to a bit of murder. Culture shock. Another quote from Ben Best when asked how we would adapt to future society. It is hard to imagine that if Benjamin Franklin were brought into the modern world that he would have any difficulty learning to use a personal computer. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to explain the internet to elderly relatives or showed a 90 year old how to use a computer. I have. There was definitely difficulty. It didn't work. No doubt some have taken like fish to water. But I think we can fairly say that if Mr. Best must have been a tad delirious if he actually believed that 316 year old Mr. Franklin would have had no issue learning how to use a computer. My point being, culture shock will be a bitch for the reanimated. For those not aware, culture shock is the feeling of disorientation experienced by someone when they are suddenly subjected to an unfamiliar culture, way of life, or set of attitudes. People often experience this when they go to unfamiliar countries. Now, Think about the changes in 400 years. Language will have evolved. Technology, obviously. Food, we might be eating bugs. Religion, government, social expectations. And that's all just assuming that your current country hasn't changed hands in that time. Education and career experience. In today's world, there's the current joke that a 25 year old starting their career will need 20 years experience just to get a foot in the door. So say you come back in 400 years time, what exactly is your education and career experience going to amount to? More than likely, pretty much squat. Now, of course, cryonic founders say that in the future world, everything will be done by robots, so humans can just relax and do whatever they like. In which case, I assume you don't need money to pay the bills. It's a very fun thought. But just as Apple or Google aren't currently hiring 90 year olds who have never used a computer, so too are you unlikely to have any luck in the future workplace. Overpopulation. We all know that the world currently has too many people on it. And shockingly enough, the countries that have these cryonic facilities are not usually the countries dealing with overpopulation. Now, our world's population shows very little sign of slowing down. And short of a few new world wars, a couple new Hitler types, a few pandemics worse than COVID, it's not going to slow down. So is it really ethical to add to the population burden that our future generations will have? Keeping in mind that those reanimated people are going to have very little to offer. Overpopulation isn't just, oh shit, there are a lot of people here. It's the depletion of resources, the extinction of other species, loss of quality of life, depletion of social and medical services and social disharmony. Which brings us neatly to my next point. Rich old white men. If we put the Chinese facility to a side for a second, what are the countries that had facilities? Oh yeah, that's right. USA, Russia, Switzerland, and Australia. Okay. And how much did it cost again? 28 to $200,000. Oh, just for storage, not for anything else. Okay. And what type of people have signed up for cryonics so far? Let me just put up on the screen a few of Ben Best's quotes. What is the gender ratio in cryonics? Two thirds of those that have signed up are male, but at the Cryonics Institute, the majority of cryonics patients are female because a number of sons who have cryonically preserved their mothers. Now, although there are female cryonics activists, the problem of a cryonics activist husband and an anti-cryonics wife have been a subject of frequent concerns. Right, so you're saying that a number of blokes with mummy issues and likely issues with consent and that women thinking differently from their husbands is an issue. All right, sounds like a great group. Got it, all right, let's move on. Does cryonics only benefit the rich? Most people who make cryonics arrangements are not rich. The vast majority of those who make cryonics arrangements are middle class people who place a greater than average importance on the possibility of a vastly extended lifespan and allocate those, their assets accordingly. Class warfare and hatred of the rich should not be used as an excuse to stop the progress of medical technology out of fear that it will disproportionately benefit the rich. 
All right. But wait, it can get worse. What happens to poor people who want to be cryonically preserved? Many people who say they are too poor to afford cryonics manage to afford nice homes or cars, vacations or expensive hobbies. What those people really mean is that cryonics is a marginal expense and they would rather buy other things than spend money on life insurance. Uh huh. I think there might be quite a few poor people that would say something different. I mean, let's be honest, if you're a rich old white guy, I'm sure life today is grand for you as it was a hundred years ago and a hundred years before that. I can see why you would love to extend your wealth and influence it to the future. And to sum up is this quote from a different company founder. Indeed, lifetime members of the Cryonics Institute could have their spouse enrolled for half price and their underage children for free. We do this to encourage family units to stay together. Now, I'm not saying that a partner and a couple of underage kids would not willingly, with no coercion at all, jump aboard this idea, but uh, death becomes more stigmatized. Death is a taboo currently in many parts of the world. It's the reason cryonics was able to get a foothold in the first place. Those in this field believe that uncertainty is better than the alternative. Better the uncertainty you know, I guess. They say when cryonics takes off in the future, the only way that people will be able to die is by serious accident, suicide or murder, which is such an uplifting thought. I guess no matter how great the world seems in the dream future, those pesty narcissists and psychopaths aren't going anywhere. But then better than dying naturally, of course. When we did our why are we scared of death video, we mentioned the human fear of being forgotten after death. Couple this with human arrogance and you can see how the idea of cryonics got its foothold. And on every single company website, there's a version of this quote. Cryonics offers a chance, not a guarantee, but the alternative is the 100% guarantee annihilation of your existence, which is a very interesting choice of words. Today's medicine governs with a similar concept. Keep people alive at all costs. Any existence is better than no existence, no matter how much the patient suffers. Or in Cryonic's case, no matter how much you might screw over the next generations. If you've enjoyed this video, please give us a like and consider subscribing. It's very much appreciated. And for those of you looking for a bit more info, I put in the description a link to Ben Bess's interview that I mentioned and quite a few other bits of information as well. I really recommend it for any of you studying psychology or for those of you studying business because this dude can market the shit out of this. And with that, thanks for watching. Now go talk death.